Hello and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest vox casting either side of the breach. On our last episode, Tuco, Edwin, Di, and Angel Eyes received a mission from Nakima to kill Jacob Lynch, proprietor of the Honeypot Casino. The four half Nephilim hybrids are journeying towards Malifaux to carry out their mission. I hope you enjoy the conclusion of The House Folds right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Breachside Broadcast is brought to you by the Honeypot Casino, home of Malifaux's loosest slots and most intoxicating liquor. Whether you fancy a flutter at the card tables, a drink at the bar, or a night with one of the friendliest companions in Malifaux, you can do it all at the Honeypot. Once you taste a shot of our signature whiskey, you'll be sure to come back night after night. On the edge of Nakima's camp sat a cluster of scavenged tents, sewn by human hands. In lieu of torches, lanterns hung from poles. Male and female half-breeds, each sporting the pallid skin, misshapen horns, and curved claws of their fellow blood wretches, mulled about, maintained weapons, cooked meals, or spoke in hushed, guttural whispers. Angel and Tuco's arrival caused quite a stir among them drawing the attention away from whatever they were doing. Along with being some of the first hybrids, each of those assembled here knew them to be among the strongest, and the most favoured by Nakima. Most of the wretches in the camp were lucky to earn quiet apathy, but a few of the particularly pitiful examples were little better than Lilu, constantly bullied and beaten by any Nephilim with an ounce of muscle mass above them. Dai broke the silence. The walking mountain of muscle gave an awkward curtsy to Angel. Good evening, Miss Angel. Long time since we saw you around these parts. Wherever I'm needed, Angel said. I heard you pull Tuco out of a fire. Nothing so dramatic. He can take care of himself, even surrounded by flame. Stop yapping, Tuco grumbled. Die, you're with us. We're headed for the city, so don't dress like a whore. Die huffed. She stormed off, muttering profanities. No wonder she likes you, Angel said. Before Tuco could offer a retort, she barked, Ed. Edwin reluctantly bobbed out of a tent, glanced at Tuco, grimaced, and ducked back inside. A hushed cry of, Tell her I ain't here, came from within, before he was shoved back out. The weaseling hybrid planted a bowler hat on his bald head and shuffled over to Angel, giving Tuco a wide berth. What is it? Need me somewhere far away from here, rather prompt-like. Yes, Angel said. Get your things. We're going to the city. We? You mean... He gestured at Tuco with a not-so-subtle nod. Tuco grabbed his collar. Yes, you little rat. Us. You'll get your shit before I remember why I hate you so much and decide to settle affairs. Edwin looked back at Angel. Fine, fine, he said as he darted off. Why do you keep him around? Tuco snapped. He's good for thieving, Angel said. He can do what I don't have the patience for. Tuco huffed. All right. Let's get this out of the way. I lost my soul to a woman given orders before, and ain't got nothing but this to show for it. He pointed at his own face. You want to play the hunter in your tree, waiting for the deer to come to you? Fine. I want to be in and out before I can finish a smoke. This old mission stinks to piss. Angel nodded. For once we agree. This isn't an assassination. It isn't even a fight. It's suicide. Tuco stared at her, waiting for a rebuke. When it didn't come, he snorted. You figure she's trying to off us? 
If Nikima wanted us dead, she'd do it herself. Wear shit under her hooves, but she never passes up an excuse to kill something. Then why? What's Lynch done to get up her backside? Don't know, Angel admitted. But she's desperate to see him dead. You just said she likes to do it herself. So she's either getting smart or she's desperate, Angel said. Which do you think it is? He smirked. But she doesn't want to look desperate. Send her least favorite minions to do the job, like lip service in the church or something. Angel shrugged. I once saw a shaman kneel down and slice open his own throat to feed his apprentices because the stars said it was a good idea. I don't even pretend to understand. Di returned, hefting a wardrobe suitcase like it was a purse in one arm and a sledgehammer in the other. Are we traveling by boat, horseback, or on foot? We'll blend in as much as we can, Angel said. So you might want to dress down. Di sighed. Story of my life. Edwin appeared behind her, having appointed her as his honorary Tuco shield. He had a duffel bag over his shoulder, his hat pulled low over his stubby horns. Been a while since I've seen the big city. Will we get a chance to scope the joint, play a few rounds? I wouldn't count on it, Angel said. They marched northeast into what was once Lilith's territory. The Knotwood was not so inhospitable here, though most creatures caught a whiff of the hybrid's black blood and gave them a wide berth. Once night crept in, they turned directly south toward Fortune Falls, where they disguised themselves just enough to hide their Nephilim traits and ambushed a walled guy that had cornered a logging team. Think they offer bounties on lumber? Angel asked, earning a chuckle from a few of them. After that, it was easy enough to join the loggers on their return to Fortune Falls, with Di helping to haul their lumber onto a flat barge and ride it downriver to the fortified town. The lumber camp seemed oddly subdued, but perhaps it was simply the oddity of the walls not being besieged by Nephilim attacks. Not sure why exactly, a strong back male said when they entered the town. There have been more attacks on the logging teams, and the north wood is more dangerous than ever, but it seems like the bastards are giving the town a breather. Angel and Suko exchanged glances. It was more likely that Nakima was busy securing Lilith's territory for her own. Fortune Falls would soon be seeing a renewed onslaught of unified packs of Nephilim. It was too expensive to charter seats on the Green Cannonball, the high-speed cargo train that delivered lumber to Malifo City, so they had to hire on for guard duty on one of the barges that made the slower journey. The trip was maddeningly boring. Not that Angel wanted to fight other Nephilim who might take word of the attack back to Nakima, but the barge was a sluggish thing with little to do but watch the shoreline and put up with the occasional too friendly stare from the barge crew. When night fell, the four hybrids gathered around a lit candle, while Edwin used a clawed finger to carve a makeshift map onto a piece of timber. I ain't seen most of the honey pot, he admitted, but no one has outside of Lynch's men. The Arcanists tried to put people on the inside a few times, and none of them lasted more than a week. There's a gang or syndicate in the Little Kingdom. Some people call them the Ten Thunders. They ain't much from what I gather, but they hold on to the casino like, well, like the honeypot it is. That and we figure Lynch has been spiking some of his drinks with something that gets people addicted twice as hard as opium. I've seen people kill for bottles of this stuff. So no eating or drinking anything, Angel said. Tuco snorted. What else? So the ground floor is mostly public, right? Cards, drinks, some of those new fruit machines, Edwin continued. New what? Di asked. You know, they're mechanical poker machines, fruit machines. Slot machines, Angel corrected. Right. Edwin gave everyone a side glance to hide his embarrassment. Most of the ground floor is set aside for it. He's also got rooms in the back where he stores goods. More cards, dice, chairs, dressing rooms for the girls. Anything needed for the casino floor. Place is a maze. It discourages the customers from leaving the main foyer. Second floor is for private rooms. High stakes gambling, private party rooms, bedrooms for whoring. Di clucked her tongue disapprovingly. Just calling it like it is, love, Edwin said. Third floor is private offices, including Lynch's office, which has a window overlooking the casino floor. But my money isn't on him being there. He's the type that likes to meet potential marks, right? 
shake hands, get them comfortable, get them spending. Maybe slip some of that lace stuff into their hooch so they keep coming back for more and don't know why. You figure he'll be on the casino floor, Angel asked. Nah, he'll be on the second. The balconies give him as good a view as his office and half the distance to walk when he spots a customer he wants to dip his hooks into. So it should be easy to take him down, Angel said. Not so fast, Edwin said. Guns and blades ain't allowed on the floor. And there are bouncers everywhere. Lynch only hires the toughest. And word is a few of these guys don't mind a load of buckshot in their evening pint if you catch me. How many? Tuco asked. Maybe twenty, Edwin said. Which isn't to say his bartenders, waitresses, hell, even his whores ain't willing to draw derries and pop a few holes in your noggin. Angel rubbed her eye. Is there any good news? Edwin frowned. That was the good news. Bad news is this place seems to only have two exits. The front door is watched every minute and has guards and watch points. And the basement isn't accessible. We tried to scout the sewers under the honeypot once. The whole thing is walled up deeper than any other structure we've ever seen in the city. Almost like there's a whole other sewer under it cut off from the rest. No idea what he's keeping down there, but it goes down into the necropolis. So what was the second exit? Tico asked. Edwin tapped the map. The kitchen on the west wall. Last I heard, the kitchen section actually overlapped onto the more accessible points in the sewers. I guess they don't like dumping their garbage into their private sewers. It'll be filthy, but it should have some kind of dumping chute we can use. But I don't know what'll be on the other side of the chute. Maybe guards. Maybe just a bunch of surprise cooks. Oh, lovely, Di said. You do know how to charm a lady. Can't be helped, Angel said. If this heap keeps pace, we'll be in the city by tomorrow night. Edwin will lead us through the sewers. We head right for the casino, enter through the kitchen, and the first glimpse we have of Lynch, we take it and get the hell out of there. This won't be a hand-holding job. If you fall behind, you're dead. And if what Edwin says about Lynch is true, I don't ever want to see you even look at what's being offered in there, because it'll probably mean it's too late, which makes you a liability and a threat. Understood? Edwin and Di nodded gravely. Tuco leaned back against the timber, adjusted his hat over his face, and went to sleep. Angel used her own claws to scratch the map of the casino onto an unintelligible mess, and then went to her post to watch the forest. Jacob Lynch was in a good mood. The honeypot, in many ways, ran as it always did. Customers entered, spent their money, so much money, and left. Most were upset, but recognised they had no one to blame but themselves. Others blamed the house, and earned a fat lip at the very least for their protests. Others left with bottles of honeypot whiskey tucked under their arms, too enthralled with the otherworldly taste of the stuff to care that they'd lost all their scrip. Men chomped on cigars and buried their noses in their cards. Women in glittering dresses nibbled ears and whispered carnal prizes. Smoke and alcohol and lust stained the air. But there was something else to the casino that evening. A kind of comfortable warmth that Lynch had never really equated to the place. Homely, even. He predicted rather than sensed Mr. Cheng's approach. The Ten Thunders advisor was completely silent when he wanted to be, but he was so punctual about killing Lynch's good moods that it never truly surprised him any more. You'll cross, Mr. Cheng, Lynch said without looking at him. Maybe you'd like to take a load off, have some whiskey. Or maybe sake. Tea? Chang merely scowled. He was good at scowling. You sent two crates of whiskey to Edge Point. I was not informed of this decision. Informed being Chang's way of saying, the one to make the decision. Lynch smirked. I spoke with the oil burn. She, Lynch emphasized the gender just to see the vein form on Chang's forehead, and I... Agreed that Edge Point has lucrative opportunities she wishes to take advantage of. My fine whiskey will have a part in securing those opportunities. I meant to tell you, but... He shrugged. I was not informed of this, Cheng repeated. Please, then, take it up with the oil bun, Lynch said. Cheng's response was to fold his arms and scowl at nothing in particular. Lynch kept his smile plastered on his face. True, taunting Cheng wasn't a good idea... 
Even though he'd thrown his lot in with Mazaki during her coup, she was a conservative. By her reasoning, her action had been for the good of the Thunders, and wasn't a personal power grab. Lynch was more willing to call a spade a spade. That being said, just because Lynch had made a deal with Mazaki did not mean Chang could not make his life difficult. Just to remind him that he was a figurehead, and that the honeypot was Chang's operation. If only he knew, Lynch mused. His mood was further threatened when Mr. Tannen ascended the stairs from the casino floor. The rat-like man folded his hands in front of him and smiled that endless creepy smile. A full house tonight, Mr. Lynch. I can see that, Lynch said. Any troubles? None, Tannen said. Poor Mr. Graves looks positively bored. Lynch smoothed over his goatee with his gloved hand. I don't like that. A calm always proceeds to storm. I've already reminded him to be on extra alert, Tannen said. I've got extra men on the entrance. No one can get in without our knowing. Somewhere over the din of the casino floor, a gunshot rang out like a flat wooden board dropped on its side. Not everyone noticed it at once, but those who did paused in their indulgences. Their expressions were similar. Recognising the unmistakable sound of a gunshot, confusion stemming from an understanding that guns were not allowed in the casino, and trepidation at the prospect of impending violence. More rapid gunfire rang out. Alarming screams came from the casino floor. People began to panic. Mr. Graves moved through the crowd like the cattle catcher on a locomotive, knocking people aside as he and his fellow bouncers hurried to engage the gunfire's source. Then Lynch saw a stick of dynamite fly, end over end, into the packed crowds. All Lynch could do was wrench his eyes from the sight as the stick exploded, turning a startled panic into a bloody meat grinder. Chaos erupted. People, injured and injuring, trampled each other as they sought the only exit. Blood splashed over discarded hands of poker. People beat each other simply for being obstacles. Glass shattered and chairs were smashed. Another stick of dynamite followed only moments after the first, tearing apart a row of Lynch's expensive new slot machines and scattering shrapnel in the form of warped metal and scorched coins. Even in the mad dash to escape, people crawling over the wreckage paused to scoop up every coin they could. A rifle shot shattered the balcony railing an inch from Lynch's hand, spraying him with splinters. He dove to the right, with both Cheng and Tannen piling on top of him in a shared attempt to escape a second shot. More gunfire peppered the balcony, and the three jostled and kicked each other in a mad dash for a support pillar, which barely provided enough cover for one man, let alone three. More gunshots struck the pillar, slamming into the lacquered wood with deep thwack, thwack, thwack sounds. I see them, Cheng said, holding his head at just an angle to see the casino floor without exposing his body to the shooter. Two men, two women. Tannen stuck his head out and ducked again as a bullet whizzed past. Nevelim hybrids. They're after us, Lynch yelled, trying to scrunch up his shoulders behind the pillar. Yet after you, Tannen corrected. Me? What did I do? More importantly, what did you do? Lynch mentally projected. He didn't have to think with anyone in specific in mind. The hungering darkness presence was like some invisible coiling presence in his mind. Nothing. Its thoughts were almost amused. Nakima strikes blindly. A bullet struck the wall at an angle that suggested the shooter was changing positions to get a clearer shot at Lynch. Lynch ducked, landing on his backside. Destroy them, the darkness intoned. Easy for you to say, Lynch thought. He plucked up his hat and pressed it down on his head. She's trying to herd you. Tannen said. She wants you to run so she can get a bead on you. Lynch sighed. Mr. Chang, you've no reason to care for my life, but surely this insult to the Thunder's domain deserves a firm reprisal. Chang's veins were throbbing, but he nodded. Mr. Tannen? The rat-like man only smiled. Lynch leapt to his feet and ran. As he went, he flicked his wrist, and the holdout pistol locked in a wrist brace under his sleeve folded out into his palm. He focused his senses, feeling the power of the hungering darkness tainting the course of fate. 
altering the imperceptible threads of cause and effect. He perceived a course of events before him, some favourable, others not. He had only a heartbeat to choose a direction, so he took it and fired his pistol at a seemingly wild angle into the crowd below. His attack was rewarded. The shot was a loud blank, but the burst of flame and smoke from his barrel startled the shooter, who dove out of the way, revealing herself from the crowd of scattering gamblers. She was cloaked in a heavy duster, with a hood and kerchief covering her face, and one of her eyes had been replaced with mechanical augmentation. As she hit the ground, she rolled into a shooter's crouch and leveled her rifle at Lynch for another shot. But it was all Mr. Tanner needed to spot her. Chittering laughter, he flicked a coin through the air toward her, the scattering of light on its polished surface drawing the shooter's attention. The coin flipped end over end, bouncing off her rifle with a distinct ping. The sound drew Mr. Graves like an angry bull. The bouncer smashed through a crowd of people and charged the shooter, swinging a broken table leg at her head. Lynch would have thought it over, but before Graves could land a skull-shattering blow, a woman who was just as big and burly as Graves blocked his post with a sledgehammer shaft and tackled him. The two rolled over broken tables and bodies while slamming fists into each other. After the burly woman came a lithe-looking man in a long coat with a devilish grin on his face. After firing on everyone he could see, he then used the tip of a cigar he'd procured to ignite another stick of dynamite and hold it just beyond the balcony. Lynch cursed as he launched himself over the railing just as the stick exploded. He wasn't sure how long it took for him to regain consciousness, but when he opened his eyes he saw a weaseled Nephilim hybrid looking down at him. Something about the man reminded Lynch of Mr. Tannen, and he snorted a laugh at the indignity of the world allowing two individuals to live with such unfortunate features. The hybrid drew a revolver and aimed it at Lynch's head. Looks like the deck's stacked against you, Mr. Lynch, he said, in a pronounced Cockney accent. Mr. Cheng appeared at the hybrid's side, materialising out of the smoke like he was part of it. Without a sound, he struck the hybrid's wrist with the edge of his hand and the bullet flew wide. Cheng followed it with a finger jab at the hybrid's face, putting him off balance and leaving him vulnerable. The hybrid managed an angry hiss before the Ten Thunders enforcer struck his exposed throat, choking off his voice, then grasped his head as if inspecting a piece of pottery and twisted. The hybrid dropped to the floor, limp. Get on your feet, Cheng said to Lynch. A bullet tore through Cheng's midsection. He collapsed over the hybrid he'd just killed, wheezing in pain. The fight had been going better than Angel had hoped. Getting in had been easy. The disposal chute was big enough even for Di to get through, and the kitchen staff had been too startled to react before the big woman had smashed their heads in with her hammer. Angel had started cursing under her breath the moment Tuco ran in, guns blazing, but she'd taken advantage of the confusion to zero in on Lynch. She and Edwin had tried to flank him, so she'd get a clear shot. And while Lynch and his flunkies had a few tricks between them, Angel's own people had been enough to keep them at bay. Then Lynch's underling had murdered Edwin, and from that moment on, it no longer felt like a job. She stalked towards Lynch, reloading her rifle and staring pure hatred into his dazed eyes. Any last words? The casino owner smirked. A bottle of my most brilliant whiskey, he shouted, loud enough to be heard by the entire room, to the one who brings me this woman's head. Angel wondered if Lynch had hit his head in the fall, or if the prospect of death had somehow driven Lynch to the madhouse. But then the screaming crowd stopped. People who had been fleeing for their lives moments before now stared at each other as if offered the world for their souls, and it sounded like a bargain. Then they looked at her, faces gaunt like men who had not tasted water in days. Their eyes faintly shimmered in the smoky light of the casino floor. Oh, hell. She turned the rifle on Lynch and fired, but the worm had taken the opportunity to duck into the crowd of people. Tuco, she shouted, opening fire at the nearest casino goer, who barely seemed to realize he was shot as he fell, his thirsty stare never breaking. 
I'm out of dynamite, he shouted back as he unloaded both barrels into the crowd. An attack had got too close, and he slashed the man's throat with his claws. Angel whirled, spotting Di still exchanging blows with Lynch's bouncer. Even as they grappled one another, a rat-like man in thick spectacles snuck up behind Di and plunged a pocket knife into her shoulder. She clobbered him with a quick elbow, knocking him off his feet, only for the bouncer to get a hold of her and bring his makeshift club down on her surprised face, smashing in teeth. He didn't stop swinging. Diamond! Tuco snarled. He opened fire on the bouncer. The buckshot ripped through the oncoming crowd, and a few grazed the bouncer's face. It wasn't enough to even make the man flinch. In a defiant response, the bouncer pulled the smaller rat-like man to his feet and ignored the fact he'd just been shot. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Any time, Tannen. Angel felt a sudden rush of cold twisting in her guts. They'd lost the advantage, and now they were hopelessly outnumbered. Tuco, we gotta go. No, he shouted back, ripping at the horde-like crowd with his claws. But for every one he put down, a dozen pressed in around him. Angel drew her sidearm and opened fire, putting pellets in skulls before grabbing him by the scruff of his coat and yanking him back towards her. For his part, he didn't object. They ran, firing behind them as they retreated to the kitchens. When the shooting stopped, Mr. Lynch joined Mr. Tannen and Mr. Graves. The casino's bouncers were already at work gathering up those who still lived. They're thirsty, Tannen pointed out. Give them each a shot, Lynch said. They did their part. Tannen nodded and went to fetch some whiskey. This way, everyone. What a scare that was, hmm? Before the authorities arrive, let's have something to take the edge off, hmm? The crowd followed him like happy, obedient dogs. Lynch knelt over Chang, checking his wound. You look like hell, Mr. Chang. Chang scowled at him. I'll live. Listen to the thunder before the next storm, Darkness whispered, then laughed. Lynch tried not to react. Good man. Lynch waved one of the bouncers over. Summon one of the low river healers and inform the Oyabun of what has happened, if she hasn't been informed already. There are many injured and others who will need to be silenced. The bouncer silently nodded and plucked up Mr. Cheng like a large and particularly ugly doll before hurrying away. Lynch took off his hat and ran a hand through his hair, surveying the damage around him, the chaos of bodies, damaged furniture and smashed equipment. The Nephilim want me dead, he said. Mr. Graves stared at him, thinking of running. It was hard to tell if he was asking a question or giving a statement. Lynch pursed his lips, but eventually shook his head. Run? Where? he sighed. No, no running for me, I'm afraid. Though it looks like I might be running out of time. Mr. Graves was silent for a few moments as he took the opportunity to claw a piece of buckshot from his cheek. His eyes shone a brilliant blue, but Lynch didn't notice. Graves' facial expression changed from uncertainty to devotion. Maybe so. But if it's all the same to you, Mr. Lynch, Mr. Tannen and I would like to remain in your employ, no matter what comes our way. Jacob Lynch wasn't sure if he was proud or terrified of that promise. To the end, then, Mr. Graves. To the end, the hungering darkness echoed in his thoughts. And that did terrify Lynch. The camp was quiet. The other Nephilim were either away on missions or returned to their yurts to sleep. A few of them stood watch, but they were well away from Nakima's throne. Angel and Tuco stood before it, where Nakima sat lounging. She had listened to their report, seemingly more interested in the gleam of her own claws than anything else. And we returned as quickly as we were able, Angel finished. I admit, Nikima said after a moment, I half expected you two to run and hide after your failure. Tuco snorted. Where would we run? The queen stared at him. Nowhere. She stood, staring them down with a cold silence that was not what either of them were accustomed to from her. 
Then she laughed, and it made Angel's blood chill. My queen? You may have failed, Nikima said, but the effect will be the same. No doubt that coward Lynch will flee for Earth. Whatever he was cooking in that hovel of his, it has no doubt been ruined. I've done my part, and you've done yours. Leave. Now. Angel and Tuco did not need any encouragement. They left the blood pit, returning to the hybrid camp. They walked in silence. Neither had spoken since they'd fled the honeypot. Once they reached two crossing paths, Angel decided to finally speak. Look, I know you're up... Tuco interrupted her with a cold stare and a clenched fist at his side. Before Angel had the chance to continue, he turned and walked away. Angel watched him leave until he faded into the woods. She couldn't shake the feeling that he'd be coming back, and not to play a game of cards. She made and then sat down by a fire, withdrawing into her mind as she started to check over her rifle, trying her best not to think about what she'd do if Tuco decided it was her fault that Diamond had died. Instead, she focused on the other events that had transpired that night. Whatever Lynch was, he was more than Nakima suspected, or she would never have sent a handful of hybrids after him. After what Angel had seen, she didn't think Lynch would run either. She let her eyes drift upward to the ever-changing stars of Malifaux's sky, wondering what they were trying to say. That's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next time for more Tales of Malifaux.